Just a few thoughts here on naturalism, and particularly Jack London. He's our little case study on naturalism, our example anyway. Uh, you've seen the notes every, and, and whatnot, and also read the short story. Just want to say a few things more about naturalism and how important the rise in the biological sciences during the 19th century uh, was for not, not just science, not just medicine, not just some of the other things, but also economics and literature and art and all these sorts of things. Um, it really meant that new explanations were being trotted out and new views were being espoused of human behavior. Uh, and this all, by the way, coincided with a, with a very ruthless era of capitalism in the country. You've all heard of the robber barons and uh, the fortunes that were made by Carnegie and Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and all of those guys. Um, and, uh, you know, this notion uh, of social Darwinism uh, put forward by Spencer and other sort of hacks in a way that, that the economy was a reflection in modern times of modern human beings, ruthless competitive survival natural selection kind of uh, environment that we you know we're not removed from nature like we think we are we're not superior to nature like we think we are in fact the naturalists really kind of saw us as being glorified animals as i said in the in the notes um and the the fact that that writers like london and others london didn't really write very much about economic things uh but others did uh in the naturalism movement really uh the fact that they were they were living during a period when it sure did look like the haves and the have-nots were involved in a fairly naked struggle for success and wealth and riches and power um, just sort of reinforce their view that you know we're, we're, we're not morally superior to animals like we think we are. We are still just greedy, selfish, you know, I just want me and my tribe to survive kind of people uh, or kind of entities or animals. Uh, we just like to think of ourselves as not being animals you know, we, we walk around preening around like a peacock would with our outfits, right? We look at a peacock and say, look at the bright feathers designed to attract a mate. And a person like London or, or Frank Norris or someone else, Theodore Greiser, would say, well, that's what human beings do. We do it all the time in our outfits. We're trying to attract mates. Um, we're trying to flaunt our wealth so that we can attract mates. We're trying to do this, that, or the other to attract mates. Some of the dating rituals or marriage rituals or all these kinds of things show how much we are basically just glorified animals. This is the way naturalism looked at things. And, uh, excuse me, let me go back a little bit here. Um, uh, this is the way they looked at things. And part of it was that they were very interested in <clears throat> this notion that um, certain natural forces, everything from our environment to the weather to our instincts to, um, you know, what motivates us, all those, all the external and even internal factors that play on our behavior force us, shape us, limit us with respect to our our free will. And what they were interested in looking at is what, you know, we put a person in a, in, a, in an extreme situation and what you'll see pretty quickly is how he resorts back to or reverts back to that animalistic instinctive nature of preservation and survival. And, um, and of course that's what you, that's kind of the backdrop here with Jack London's story. But of course he doesn't survive. The man doesn't, notice the man doesn't really have a name, neither does the dog. It doesn't matter, right? Just any old guy, whatever. Um, the old timer just has the name the old timer, basically, right? There's smart old dude who has survived and therefore lived a long life. And then there's young stupid dude who thinks it's okay to go out in 40 below weather and he's going to be fine. Um, stupidity loses. Guess what? The way a Darwinian would look at it would be stupid people don't survive. Their genes don't get passed along because they're too stupid to survive and you know, thrive and flourish and mate and have children, etc. Therefore, dumb genes get washed out of the gene pool. Um, now, we know that that kind of thing is not entirely the, 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 the full picture when it comes to the human experience, okay? It's a pretty narrow thing. But it was the way people were beginning to think about human beings in certain circles in the late 19th century. And again, like I said, the capitalism of the era, the ruthlessness of it, kind of was a, a, a very big reason why people began looking at human nature that way with a rather jaundiced view of ourselves I would think I think we're more no noble than that but that's just me um, I, I'm, I'm no naturalist I can tell you that but 
one thing that I think is very interesting about naturalist fiction, you can see it in To Build a Fire, is that unlike romantic fiction, there really is no guaranteed happy ending here. Well, in this story, there is no happy ending. I mean, I guess unless you're the dog, and we don't know, we don't even know there whether the dog survives. But um, there's no moral presupposition, right? You know, there's no, well, he needs to survive because he's heroic. There's no such thing as heroism. There's no such thing as, as really kind of right and wrong other than right choices that lead to survival and wrong choices that lead to death. Um, he makes one big stupid error. Never light a fire under a branch that's filled with snow. Don't do it. Really dumb. What? Actually, that's wrong. There's a bigger error than that. Right, As my bullet point says there, nature gives us instincts, it gives us intellect. That's what we have. We, we make tools as animals. We make all of these things based on our intellect. It's our great survival mechanism is our intellect. We have the ability to problem solve and create tools. and create. Because think about what we are. Think about this. Human beings, and if you don't think so, step outside on a hot summer day in, in Texas or a cold winter day in Minnesota. Human beings are actually a, a species that are essentially tropical animals. I mean, look at us. I mean, um, you know, we don't have a lot of hair. Well, some people do, but most of us don't have a lot of hair. We're not furry. What do we do to compensate for that when we live in cold environments? We have these things called clothing. What is clothing? Clothing is wool or cotton. It's basically an artificial fur. When you're wearing an outfit, you are basically, we make our own fur and put it on ourselves. And then we have the ability, because we have this thing called a wardrobe, to pick and choose the kind of fur we want for the day based on the conditions. In other words, we're able to thrive in a variety of different environments because we make our own environments. Today, with air conditioning and heating, even our cars are able to air, be air conditioned and heated. We create our own environmental bubble, right? We do that. We create our own little little ecosystem, our own little bubble. And if your air goes out, like mine did about a week ago, you learn really quickly. Ah, boy, it's really hot in Texas. What am I doing living here? Um, then the air comes back on and you say, ah, now I know why I'm living here. It's great. Um, or if it's cold and freezing and really, really uh, icy outside, you say to yourself, what in the world? You know, if your heat goes out, you find out really, really quickly. What, what all this is designed to say, and I think London is trying to do this, is we are way more vulnerable than we want to think we are. We are so darn confident in our in intelligence, in our tools, in our technology, in our, in our ability to create our own ecosystems, our own little environmental bubbles, our own adaptations that, I mean, look at us, we're the only creature that we know of on planet Earth that's ever been into outer space. We created our own ecosystem in a tiny little metal tube and sent it up into space called a rocket. Um, we're capable of doing it. So we have this, this false notion that we're capable of almost anything, that we're almost indestructible, we're invincible. And I think what London is trying to say is, you are a lot more invincible than you think you are. Um, and you find that out really quickly and with tragic results, um, you know, when something goes bad. And all it takes is one mistake and then it is too late. Um, and he's also depicting in here a situation where, and it's pretty apparent, nature simply does not care. You know, there's no miracle from the sky that pulls him out of this problem. Uh, even the dog doesn't care after a while. This is purely a relationship of, of uh, opportunism. The dog hangs around with him because the man has food and the man has fire and the man, you know, provides, etc. It's a mutually beneficial relationship, but when that breaks down, the dog is gone. Um, by the way, I think London's actually wrong about this. I think dogs are so well trained to be human companions that they act more heroically than in self in, in more of a self-sacrificing way than London gives them credit for. We we actually know that. Um, but this is an environment. He's trying to make a point here. Nature doesn't care. In London's world, as he's depicting it, there's no God or heroism in any of this. Um, it strikes many of us as being very stark, very bleak, but he is trying to make a deeper point other than, you know, life sucks and then you die. He's trying to make a point about, as and remember, this is the end of the 19th century with locomotives and automobiles on the horizon and uh, steel and high-rise buildings being created and, 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 and cures for diseases. You know, London is giving us, in some ways, a cautionary tale here to say, hold on a minute, you're a lot more vulnerable than you think you are. Human beings are not gods. Human beings 
are very, very easily destroyed. Sometimes by their own stupidity, sometimes by meaningless sorts of things. Stephen Crane writes a short story called The Open Boat, and it, it really is about the limitations of human, um, human ability. Uh, Frank Norris writes, uh, uh, you know, McTeague and other, other stories, The Octopus, where he's really talking about economics and, and human, human behavior. Uh, but that's what these writers, it's a fairly small group of them, but they're very influential, are really interested in. What are the environmental and, and internal, external and internal factors that are really kind of beyond our control that influence us to behave in ways that we sometimes don't realize that we don't necessarily have the kind of freedom of will that we like to think we do and we don't have the kind of power that we kind of that we think we do very very much in opposition to the way maybe a romantic would look at things i can't imagine a movement that's even uh, that's more polar opposite to romanticism than naturalism in some respects